Uh, I don't know what's happening there. So I'm, um, I guess to get started, uh, I put, we put together a presentation here while, while we wait for Sivan to get here. I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen. Um, but today, unlike last call, where we kind of dominated the conversation talking about the model, and Andrew, Andrew was presenting it, this conversation should be uh, a little bit more of a, a dialogue. Um, our topic today is going to be um, cultivation. Uh, their licenses and tiering, um, or, and we've kind of broken it into a few different uh, uh, topics that I think we want to discuss. So, give me a second while I while I share my screen and, and see if Sivan uh, Sivan is able to join. Um, so, okay, wait one sec. I think the right person needs to click on the admit button. Oh, for some reason that's me. <laughs> it says I'm admitting Savannah. Is uh, Savannah you in here yet? I am. I'm not sure what happened. I, I've been sitting in the waiting room since uh, 10 minutes ago or so. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I, I tried to hit admit a couple of times and it uh, didn't seem to let you in. Uh, so I don't know. Tough bouncers here. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see this uh, the presentation yet or no? Yes. Yes, we can. Thanks. Dan. All right. Beautiful. Um, so, um, so here's the. I, I'll just start moving through it quickly. Here's the agenda, which we already have. Uh, we've already seen. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to talk about three different topics. They're going to be uh, the estimated total canopy needed for the market, cultivation tiering, uh, in particular, how we want to handle outdoor cultivation. And then uh, kind of follow up on a, a point that Sivan raised last time, um, just to talk a little bit about uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial demand, entrepreneurial demand, uh, and um, kind of a, a system to try to deal with that and figure out a way to figure out who's going to apply. Um, and then we reserve some time at the end to uh, cover uh, public comments. So. Um, but before we jump into it, just a couple of housekeeping things. We talked about it a little bit on the last call, but I uh, wanted to present kind of our thinking for the next handful of meetings as we prepare for this October 1 report deadline. Um, so we kind of broke up the next few meetings by topic. This meeting, as we mentioned, is cultivation. Thursday's meeting, I think we'd like to talk about other um, license types, their retail, manufacturing, uh, wholesale license types, and then uh, other license types that may be up for discussion. A week from today, uh, we'd like to talk about local issues, uh, particularly local fees, the local process, uh, and then also have some discussion at the end of that of putting some numbers on paper for the state fees. So we'll talk a little bit about the um, CCB's projected budget and some of the, the um, requirements there. And then uh, our goal would be to have um, Kind of an outline of some of the fee recommendations that we need for that October 1 report uh, to present on that uh, Thursday, September 23rd uh, meeting. So that meeting, we're kind of not giving topics. We're, we just kind of have what we have distilled from these meetings, put onto paper, and we can kind of run through them and discuss it. Uh, there's actually time for one more meeting before we kind of need to wrap up that report. But right now, I figured we'd hold that for any kind of topics that uh, need immediate discussion or if we kind of run out of time on any of these other topics because this is a very condensed timeline obviously I then also kind of save that meeting for, for review of the final discussions before they I mean final recommendations before they go into the um, to the report from the from the board to the legislature so um, hope that makes sense if not uh, or if you have any comments or questions 
uh, you can feel free to email me or, or bring them up as we're kind of talking about these different topics. Um, and then the last thing before we jump into our um, presentation here, I just wanted to, um, I just added a couple slides on the statutory provisions. All of these are in those reference materials that I think Tom sent to you uh, last week, but um, just wanted to highlight the ones that are relevant for, for today. I won't, we're, have a jam-packed agenda, so I won't go through all of it, but here's the kind of the, the language for the 10-1 report that we need to uh, address, just on which fees we need to cover, um, what what license fees and types we need to cover, and things along those lines. Dan, uh, this is James Pepper. We're not seeing any, any changes to the slides. We just see the kind of cover page, VS Strategies, or other... Oh. Right. Yeah, sorry, I thought I was flipping through. Give me one second. Okay. Now do you see it? No. No. No, no still further. I think you have to do it on the actual teams. So you guys seeing it flipped now? No. 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 No one I see a black screen. <laughs> Let me try to reload it. Um, if you send it to me, I'm happy to flip through on your behalf. Now do we have it? Still no? Oh, oh there we go. We got it now? All right. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I was seeing a flip on mine, which was uh, not, uh, not helpful to everyone else. But so here's the topics. Here's the 10-1 uh, report language. Um, I think everyone's seen that before. What I did here is I just pulled out a couple of things that will affect this subgroup today, um, just that we have to address reducing or eliminating license fees for individuals from communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition uh, or directly or personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. I know there's another subgroup that's working on those definitions and how to integrate those, but as we come up with license fee recommendations, we're going to have to address that there'll be lower fees for um, social equity applicants and those who are uh, impacted by the war on drugs. Um, there's also a statutory license fee of $50,000 for integrated licenses. So that sort of needs to be factored into um, what we think are reasonable fees because uh, you know those, those businesses are gonna be required to, to pay those anyways. And then uh, lastly, there's a uh, statutory requirement that we tier um, cultivation licenses and retail licenses. Um, the board has uh, discretion over tiering other, other license types. And then I just pulled the only statutory tier that's created are these small cultivators. Um, so here's the information from the statute on uh, what those entail. Um, you can see the definition at the top and then the various provisions um, <clears throat> kind of related to that. So uh, don't probably have time to dive too fully into each aspect of that since we're already well behind due to my technical, uh, technical problems, um, but uh, we will, we can like, we'll refer to those throughout the day, but uh, now we'll jump into the discussion topic. So uh, the first one is basically the, the conclusion to Andrew's uh, presentation on last Thursday's uh, meeting. So um, you all saw the model and you were, had a little bit of time to play around with it, um, but kind of the main purpose of creating that whole model was so that we could try to estimate uh, what the supply and demand of uh, cannabis in Vermont would be um, so we, Andrew showed you kind of the, the uh, you know, the assumptions made in that model, how that model works, um, but we didn't kind of, we kind of hit, I think we hit the, hit the, uh, the, the main point there um, towards the end, but as you play with it and you see demand and supply um, over time, um, there's kind of a range of flower and canopy that you need to have in order to make sure that you meet 100% of the demand but don't create a, a, a vast surplus um, that will either cause prices to, to plummet um, or uh, you know, lead to incentives to uh, ship some of that surplus into, into the illicit market or into other states. So um, I don't know, Andrew, if you wanna 
jump in here, but kind of that sweet spot, according to the to the model that we're looking at, uh, seems to be between 350 uh, 350,000 square feet to 400,000 square feet of uh, flower and canopy. Um, so, uh, Andrew, if you want to kind of take over here, that's fine, or I can run through it. I know you were the one to put together yeah. the model, so you might have a better sense of uh, how you want to explain that. Yeah, so I'm happy to explain this. So this is based on looking at medical and adult use demand um, as currently as well as uh, the projections going forward. Um, while, the, while this 350 to 400,000 square feet, that would be inclusive of both medical and adult use. Um, while we don't have the, the entire numbers on the total amount of cultivation, or at least I, I don't, uh, from medical cannabis cultivators, Lindsay Wells and some others from the, the uh, agency may, may have that. I know we're discussing to try to obtain some more of that information. Uh, from my conversations with the existing operators, their total, total currently operational flowering canopy is not all that huge. Uh, I'd be very surprised if all of them together was any larger than 15,000 square feet of uh, flowering canopy in utilization. Um, so when we're looking at this, um, you know, really trying to identify, okay, based upon the total amount of demand and how that demand comes in the form of flour and concentrates and manufactured products, with obviously some adjustments given the fact that uh, Vermont will have a relatively unique landscape as far as uh, permitted products, permitted product forms, that of course uh, will alter the demand profile. Um, assuming those different uh, those data points as well as the, the ramp up of, of market capture by the, the regulated market, um, you know, Dan and I and a few others you know, played around with the model for quite a bit of time to try to look at specifically you know, at what points is um, is the market is is the market really serving far more um, than than we essentially would likely need? Um, and this isn't necessarily that okay. We're going to put a you know strict cap on that much square footage. Um, but I think probably what makes the most sense is to license individuals, open the door on the licensing, license individuals with a small canopy size to start with and have individuals enter the market. And as, you know, like we were making the bouncer joke at the front, at some point you're thinking and looking around and you're, you're asking, you know, is, is, the, is the club reaching fire capacity? Um, and at some times you start slowing down the line um, or for a period of time, close, you know, uh, not admit new people in until others have, have left. Um, and there's some, some history of, of states like Oregon and, doing the, uh, and some others doing that um, as a means of um, controlling you know, oversupply. Um, another thing to note is that this model does take into consideration a few things, uh, which I think are important for people on the <coughs> call to note. So not everyone is going to be growing at the amount of canopy that they say that they have, right? Let's say you have, and, and this is evident in Colorado, it's evident in Washington, um, and while we don't have the exact research on this, it, it seems to be evident in Massachusetts as well. Is that Colorado, you know, the, there's a certain amount of plant count uh, that they have allocated to each of one of them. And depending on the month, um, you know, even there is some seasonality to this, but, but it still um, follows is that um, not all of the cannabis is is being utilized. Um, so in, in those in those places, it's, it depends, but it could be anywhere from like only 40 to 60% of your allocated canopy is actually utilized. Um, I have to set forward that, uh, some of that data from the Colorado report, as well as from a, a Washington state uh, canopy utilization report. So this, this model does have an adjustable assumption that says that only 65% of the allocated canopy is actually going to be utilized. So, you know, if, if let's say we're allocating 400,000 square feet of flowering canopy, and that's not total building facility, that's just flowering canopy. So usually total building is about twice that, depending on what style building you're building and, and how you're utilizing your canopy within that square footage. So that would really only only assume that 65% of even that 400,000 would be utilized based on what we're seeing in, in, in other states is kind of 
those norms. So at around 400,000 square feet, depending on what month you're in, you know, there's certain periods of time when you start getting to that, um, even on a rolling basis, taking into account uh, the shelf life of products, that you have inventory that's about 140 to 160% above what we estimate demand to be. Um, and those that gets to the point there where you know you start worrying a little bit about oversupply, particularly as you get into the 180 to 200 percent of um, you know of what really it seems so the market is demanding at that point. Um, so that's kind of where we got to the 350 to 400 thousand uh, square feet of liner canopy, and we, we'll discuss a little bit later about how it pertains <clears throat> to indoor versus outdoor, kind of what is the right mix there, um, because indoor and outdoor, from my perspective. Uh, ends up looking at you know um, seasonal harvest versus non-seasonal harvest, and I think that's an important way to, to look at it when it comes to uh, the the flow of supply uh, as it intermixes with the flow of demand throughout a year. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think um, our next topic is going to be, uh, or like in a second, we'll start talking about tiering and outdoor. But yeah. I want to stop now. And for questions, because no one's had a chance to, to hit you with questions over the model uh, um, I think or Stephanie's about anything else. So, yeah, yeah, Stephanie, I see your hand raised. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to um, ask a question concerning um, there's a provision in Act 1. No, it's actually in X65, whatever, the one that just passed. Um, looking yeah. at the, uh, the cultivation of hemp and the extraction of CBD to create THC and whether or not that has been factored into this um, flowering canopy. And I don't, there's a larger policy discussion regarding whether or not the Cannabis Control Board is interested in um, venturing down that road, I guess. Um, but that, I just was curious, I guess. Yeah, Stephanie, so you're talking about essentially hemp CBD isolate with biosynthesis turning hemp CBD isolate back into THC? Yes. Yeah. So while, you know, there's, there's one question about like, is that, you know, is that factored in the model? The answer to that is, is no, this is not factored in. The other thing is that it's probably more, it, particularly if you're talking about, you know, in the Vermont market, like cannabis is a really good plant at producing THC. And I would imagine that it's, it will be cheaper in Vermont to extract THC from cannabis that's grown in the state than it would be to buy CBD isolate and through biosynthesis convert it back into THC. Now, I, I might be wrong on that, uh, but I, I don't see that as likely. Now, thanks to your, your help, you know, you and I uh, corresponded a little bit a, a number of weeks ago. You, you did provide some, some great data on um, hemp harvest and things like that. And I did look, because in Vermont, I think what we're likely gonna have is that business operators, in order to comply with some of the requirements for uh, THC potency in concentrated forms, will essentially use other cannabinoids to balance that out. And so your vape pens are all gonna be one-to-one -one CBD to THC. And I think what's likely there, Stephanie, is that people will buy hemp CBD from both within Vermont and across and from other places, <clears throat> buy legal hemp CBD, and if it's permitted, utilize that as an input ingredient to essentially balance out the ratios in their concentrated products so that they meet statutory limitations. So the model does take into consideration <clears throat> some adjustable assumptions for how much hemp CBD may be needed as an input ingredient in the model in the market, in order to meet the statutory limitations of the concentrates that are produced, does that make sense? I see there's a, a, a you question. Might, you might be on. I don't know if that's Chris here. or if that's. Uh... Yeah, that's Chris. Hey there. Um, just trying to get some clarity. You you semi answered one of my questions already because as I'm looking at the 350 to 400 thousand square feet, obviously, um, how much is indoor, how much is outdoor is going to be a, a, a major factor in what your yearly output is going to be. Um, I guess part two of that uh, is, have you guys done any uh, 
calculations on what that much canopy will provide per year pound wise? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, the model is a little bit complex because you have both wet weight harvest as well as dry weight harvest. Yeah. yeah. Right? I'm, I'm talking canvas. dry weight. Yeah. Yeah. So the model actually allows for some of the, um, the cannabis to be pulled as wet weight initially for the production of like live resin, uh, live rosin and, and other things like that, high end concentrated forms. Um, so it's a little bit different, but if we're looking at, um, I'm just going to look at total wet uh, flower yields here in total. And then I'm going to assume that we have um, the 75% water loss uh -huh. um, to dry weight. Second. And I have the model currently set just to give you guys some clarity at um, it says 320,000 square feet of out of uh, indoor and 64,000 square feet of indoor. Um, just trying to get that DD20. Give it the end of results and I'll be able to tell you this in a second. I have it in grams, not in. Uh, Not pounds. We can convert that easily. Oh, super easy. Uh, by 453.592. Yep. Um, so that seems to be, and we're just looking at flower. Now, obviously, trim produces a, a another uh, pretty significant quantity. Yep. Um, and I, I can tell you what that is as well. So you know, it would depend year to year as as the model you know does contain that that random number generator for how much is is being produced. But we're looking at roughly fifty five. Uh, thousand pounds of flour and about eleven thousand pounds of trim. So fifty-five thousand. So fifty-five thousand fine finished flour. Yep. And then another about eleven thousand. Like I'm looking at this right now for 2025. And and again, these numbers will change because of the way that the model incorporates the randomization, essentially the unknown of how long it takes someone to go from final license to, you know, having their facility built out. So it'll differ a little bit, uh, but it's generally around 55,000 pounds, a little more than that, 55 to 56,000 pounds of dry flour, yeah. assuming you have uh, water loss of um, 75%. Yep. Um, and then about 11,000 pounds, a little more than that, a little more than 11,000 pounds of trim, which would then go into concentrated products. Some of your flour will also go into concentrates as well for high end concentrates. So you're, you're saying that just, you're calculating just trim for concentrates, no like no bud runs for concentrates. No, the model does include some bud runs. So it's all adjustable assumptions. Right now I have it at, this all, you know, we can change this relatively easily. Right now the indoor I have it as 3% of the wet flour and 5% of dry flour goes to concentrates. Yeah. And 8% of dry flour uh, for outdoor goes to concentrates. And then 100% of trim. So in, in both cases, it's not quite 8% on both because the wet flour, dry flour, obviously there's less dry flour when the wet flour is taken out, but it's by and large about 8%.
And that, when adjusting the model, seemed to work about right. It's all a bit of educated guesswork to, to try to figure out, okay, what, what is the, the bounds, the range? And, and this is why, you know, I don't think that, you know, if I said, okay, we should produce exactly, you know, 3,750,000, you know, 375,000, uh, sorry, 375,000 square feet, right? Like, I don't think a hard and fast rule makes sense here. Obviously, there's a lot of assumptions. I personally think for consumer sales reasons, uh, it's better to have slight overages than it is to have slight shortages. Uh, so we're really looking at, okay, what, it, what in the market, even when considering that not everyone is gonna grow their capacity, um, that we aren't getting to like producing twice as much as we need. Have you also calculated, um, you're giving me the ratios of indoor to outdoor, but what about the, um, you know, the different size canopies for different tiers of growing? Have you guys done any yeah, like, so, split models on that? So that isn't in the model itself. You know, I think as it would pertain there, there's a question of, do you have different yield efficiencies at different sizes? There's not really enough research to show that uh, at this point, or at least I, I don't, I haven't seen that. This model estimates about 40 grams a square foot per flowering canopy uh, per harvest, uh, and 30 grams of flowering canopy per harvest for outdoor, um, which it lines up both with what I got from the medical operators, what I've worked on with, with um, facilities around the country, um, and from my conversations with outdoor growers uh, in other places around the country, legal outdoor growers. Um, as far as how we split it out, you know, I think this is a question that blends into a bit of what uh, Dan had noted for later on, which uh, in today's discussion, why don't, we, is, why don't we just jump over there? Yeah, now, why don't we just jump there? Then? Like, it's all, it's all kind of the same. We just try to break it out into, I mean, it's all, it's all part of the same discussion. So our next slide is just gonna be um, judging from starting from that overall canopy, we need to start uh, figuring out how to um, to divide it up by tier, and then obviously yeah. Vermont would like to promote outdoor cultivation, so we started to to uh, to run through that. So Andrew, you can continue. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, no, no, we can no, jump no. into Thanks. this conversation now. Thanks, Dan. That's that's perfect. And sorry, guys, I'm not on video. My my bandwidth in my house is not great, and video just means that there's a much higher likelihood that my my feed's going to cut out. Um, <laughs> As, as James and Bren uh, thankfully uh, dealt with me on uh, last week. So um, here's, what I, here's what I personally think might make a lot of sense, but I, I wanna hear what other people have. And, and there's, there's two good models of different states for tiering. Um, and I think there's some other, there's a handful of other states as well, but for all intents and purposes, because between Dan and I and Jen, we know these two states like the back of our hand, we can look at Massachusetts and Colorado. Both of them have tier structures. Um, I think you know Colorado is weird because it does plants first. What makes a lot more sense um, in Massachusetts is square feet. Now the question is, first of all, do we want the tier to be based on square feet of cultivation, or do we want the tier to be specific on square feet of flowering canopy? I think the square feet of flowering canopy gives us a little bit more specificity on exactly how much is being outputted, but could be a little bit more arduous. Um, both from a evaluation perspective and from just a flexibility of a cultivator that like maybe they want to do a lot more vegging at a certain time or at a certain times they're going to want to have less vegging and more flowering. So I think that there's, there's good reasons to go with what Mass did and, and, and do the total uh, cultivation. And in that case, we'll just have to make some estimates of you know what is 400,000 square feet of flowering as it pertains to all total cultivation, probably somewhere around six to 700,000 square feet. But to get into the larger question of tiers, I think that the two big distinctions between Massachusetts and Colorado, at least in the current environment, is that in Massachusetts, you can apply for any of the tier um, canopies that go from what I think it's what, 5,000 square feet at the lowest around there to about 100,000 square feet, right? So you could apply for and to say, I'm gonna start out at 60,000 square feet, or I'm gonna start out at no more than 30,000 square feet. Um, whereas in Colorado, you start out at the lowest tier and you have to build your way up. I think a, a hybrid approach to this probably makes the most sense. 
So we'll have, you know, potentially have two different uh, structures for indoor and outdoor. And by outdoor, I mean seasonal harvest. So, you know, you might have some little bit of light deprivation, greenhouse stuff, particularly for your, your, um, your, you know, seedlings, your clones, and your vegetative plants. But on outdoor, you'd really just be doing straight outdoor or hoop houses. And you'd be harvesting in Vermont only once a year because it's Vermont. Um, and the season is pretty short. And so maybe you, you have a handful of different tiers. Let's say, for instance, we had five tiers for, for outdoor, you know, 500 square feet of flowering, 1,000 square feet of flowering, 1,500 square feet of flowering, and then 3,000 and 5,000, for instance. Right? And maybe you could start at any one of the first three bottom tiers. You could say, I'm going to choose 500 or I'm going to choose 1,500. But if you wanted to grow 5,000, you'd actually have to jump the tier. You'd have to start at the highest tier you can enter in, and you'd have to graduate. Right? Maybe that's also the case for um, for indoor as well. Maybe the highest tier, if you're really getting large, is you know 30, 40, 50 thousand square feet. But you'd only be able to start at the highest tier. You know, there'd be different entry tiers, whether it's a thousand or two thousand or five thousand or even maybe ten thousand. But maybe you couldn't start at any more than ten thousand square feet of flowering canopy, and you'd have to graduate up. So there's a little bit of flexibility from what size grow you want to start at. But then, um, you know, growth within those tiers, and there are larger, larger and larger tiers up to you know a point that Vermont feels comfortable. Um, but that you couldn't necessarily enter in at the largest tier. So those are just some of the things that Dan and I and Jen have been talking about previously. And then I'd love to hear thoughts from other people um, on the meeting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Andrew. So yeah, we. As he's mentioned, these are kind of in principle. That was kind of how we thought uh, might make sense. Um, uh, like the different tiers starting at a, obviously quite a smaller number than some of the larger states, uh, since the overall canopy is going to be lower. But um, we want to hear from the. Does any of the members of the subcommittee have any thoughts on on kind of the principle, not necessarily what those tiers are, but just the principle of of different tiers and then moving between them uh, if you can show demand or, or you can graduate up um, and then maybe building in some larger tiers uh, uh, for for later down the road if in case uh, the market continues to develop or businesses continue to develop. Um, I, I like the idea. Uh, it sounds reasonable to me, starting small, proving success, getting larger um, in both inside, indoor and outdoor cultivation. Um, I agree with your definitions of what is indoor and outdoor. It's how we apply it in the HEP program, so that works for me. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I, the principle works. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from others on the subcommittee. Chris or Sivan, you either of you guys have, have thoughts on the principle at least, or any questions, or uh, on kind of what we're thinking? Yeah, I don't have anything to add other than to say anything you've said so far seems to make sense. I just keep coming back to how you're going to split this up because if a lot of this 400,000 square feet is smaller, uh, smaller square footage grows. Like I'm wrapping my head around how you're going to regulate this a lot of square footage to regulate. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of moving parts here. Um, oh, you can go, Andrew. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, that, that's a big question that I think gets into the into the into some of the additional thoughts on how do we gauge entrepreneurial demand? And, and by that I mean, like, demand to be a cannabis grower in Vermont, right? You know, we were looking at, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the last meeting, you know, it's like, what state do I maybe try to compare Vermont to? And uh, it's the other, it's the other cold, isolated rural state, which is Alaska, uh, which because it's it's a state that similarly has a very residentially focused, you know, trying to get uh, the entrepreneurs who live in the state. Um, they've got pretty strict residency requirements out there. Um, it's also a relatively small market. I, I think there's, you know, only about what is it, uh, three quarters of a million people in Alaska. And so Dan and I and Jen were doing some evaluations. And Dan, I'm not sure if you have a, a 
the more precise number on this, but I think it was about what 150 or so growers um, in Alaska. There's a little bit of complications because they have two different license types. Um, so then the question is, is, you know, how many growers is there naturally going to be in applying in, in Vermont? And if we had, let's say we had, you know, 100, uh, 100 growers, you know, it's a lot to regulate in a, in a small state, but if their average canopy size was about 3,000 to 4,000 square feet of flowering canopy, that, that'd be exactly perfect. Um, and so I think part of the desire is to welcome as many of these small growers as possible, um, which, you know, is it's perfect because if we're trying to welcome as many small growers as possible, but we also don't have a giant market size, then all those small growers are just going to need to stay small. And maybe over time, as you know, eventually a federal legalization happens, things like that, hopefully some of these, these small growers get larger um, you know, when they're able to export to Massachusetts or New York or wherever else. But you know, for the time purposes, um, you know, we really have to look at what that average is going to be. Um, and this also gets into the question of how can we gauge the intent um, to cultivate? How, how do we know if we have 100,000 growers I'm sorry, if we have 100 growers, um, how many of them want to grow between, you know, 1,000 and 3,000 square feet of flowering canopy, and how many of them want to grow, you know, five to 10,000 square feet of canopy? And, and how do we prioritize that as it comes to who gets let through the door? You know, we know that um, there's a lot of, of ability as it, as it pertains to um, determining, you know, who who gets their application uh, reviewed, which ones get approved, and how does that prioritize uh, to be able to ensure that there is a good balance and a balance that matches the desires both of the state as well as the needs of the market um, you know, as, as they get licensed. Yeah, Chris, you keep anticipating our next slide. Um, so that, that's what Andrew was touching upon. One of the things that we were going to talk about next, if you can just look into this conversation um, now, is uh, back on kind of the principles of things that we think could be important for Vermont uh, would be to create some sort of uh, like uh, application of intent or provisional license, an early phase provisional licensure um, where those who are interested uh, in applying can, uh, you know, but compile some of the necessary materials and apply for, for that initial uh, piece um, without having everything lined up, um, you know, without maybe not having a property lined up or the local approval lined up. But uh, we kind of thought there's a handful of benefits that help, um, that would help the, help the state and help those operating within the state. First one being, one, it's a little difficult to see or project right now what the demand for what the entrepreneur entrepreneurial demand is going to be in Vermont and that will give uh, the board members a, a sense earlier in the process rather than waiting for the full application process to start. Um, second one is that you know it, it can be cheaper for those who are trying to operate in the state to be able to kind of get initial approval for some of these things about you know any of the required background checks any of that sort of uh, sort of thing before they have to start you know paying rent on a facility or, or anything like that. I, I'll, I'll defer to to Andrew and Jen if they want to talk about more of the benefits, but um, that was one of the things that we were going to throw out to you guys and see if there's any thoughts from the subcommittee. Um, we think some sort of process like that could be helpful. Um, uh, you know, we could have an iron out the details and, and those can probably wait until after the October 1 report, but just creating some sort of process to have uh, initial uh, approval um, uh, bef like before final approval uh, kind of early in the process to to gauge uh, you know gauge demand gauge supply problems gauge uh, <coughs> interest things along those lines okay, um, so Stephanie I see you have a question or, oh, or so, yeah someone else Stephanie with the question and then I think Jen wanted to speak okay on. I was just um, I was just gonna um, say that the provisional license could be helpful, I mean, also to the Cannabis Control Board, but also to growers in the market in that they, so long as they know that they can proceed to the next steps without, I mean, obviously they would have to demonstrate something, the details um, we don't know yet, um, but being able to um, to work towards something and, and, I mean, just 
a slower rollout. Like if we just release licenses and everybody just rushes, then the folks who don't have an opportunity to get their ducks in line are going to be at a loss. Um, so I, I, I like the idea of a provisional um, step, uh, meeting certain standards um, that would then guarantee that individual a license at some point down the road. Um, or uh, or even, well, maybe this might not work, but um, a license post dated to being effective to assist with a rollout, but I don't know, that might not work entirely um, relative to what you're talking about. But anyway, um, I just, I've, I've heard some comments from folks, so. So if, if I can just give like a brief perspective of what I saw as a regulator in Massachusetts when, when we were establishing the regs, you know, looking to, to help equity applicants, trying to help small businesses. Um, and that's where we came up with the micro licenses, the craft cultivators, uh, the, the co-ops um, and the like is that one, it's gonna be difficult to time it with the growing season if you're focusing on outdoor cultivation. If they don't get the seeds in the, I'm sure all of you know, they don't get the seeds in the ground at a certain time, then the whole season is lost. Um, and so that was a, a problem that we saw. But the other thing too though is that as people start to decide whether they wanna get into this or not, because I can almost guarantee that some are waiting to find out what the process is before they choose to get involved with this. Um, it, it's helpful to have provisional licenses. It's helpful to have those steps in place because one, d depending upon how well financed someone is, they're not gonna be able to get their financing right away. I mean, that was a big problem for some of our applicants early on is that there's no banking services. You're not going out to get a loan. Uh, you're going to hit up your friends, your family, and, and everyone in between. Um, so when you talk about the cost of what it's going to take from them deciding to apply to what this the control board is going to have as a process could be lengthy, but it could be more costly. So I think that, you know, keep in mind, one, obviously the timing, but secondly, you know, whatever process the board comes up with for their licensing process. Like we've, for instance, had a provisional and then a final license. You know, there's some time in between. Some people said it took too long. Some people said it wasn't. Um, those are just the things to keep in, in the back of your mind. You know, and, and I heard that it's gonna be a lot for the cannabis board to enforce. You don't know how many people are gonna, you know, apply at the time. There could be a large amount of small properties that is going to need enforcement services, which means you're going to have to have inspectors or enforcement officers. You're going to have to make sure that things are in place and there's constant visits and, and things of that nature. So there's a there's a really big picture to, to remember as, as we're moving forward with, especially with the recommendations and what Andrew's um, recommendations are from his, from his model. Sivan? Three minutes. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I, I cut out briefly, so someone may have asked this question, but I don't think I heard it. Um, should we be expecting any sort of correlation uh, between small growers and outdoor? You know, it strikes me as a very rural state. We, we may have a lot of people who find lower barriers to entry and get into this by, you know, they're already farmers or they already have land or things like that. And, you know, Will that lead to any concerns we should have of just, you know, some of those people being overweight, one type of growth? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, a good point and a good question. I think, uh, and we have just started to think about, um, you know, the, the statute has wants uh, prioritization for you know, outdoor growth and for small growers. So some of these things start to fit and prioritizing different things. So some of them start to fit together where you're, you know, where maybe you want to create a, a real easy, low fee, um, uh, like a low fee license for small cultivators who are growing outside. Um, you know, like what we, 
we, you know, we haven't made recommendations or, or anything on that, but uh, th those things start to fit together, and then you might start looking at a thing where most of the outdoor cultivation are small are small farmers, um, which has both benefits and I guess you could make an argument that there's some drawbacks too. If they, you know, if there's some financing issues that hit small farmers, is going to hit all the whole outdoor cultivation market more. You know, there's there's some issues um, with kind of. Uh, having uh, size and you know cultivation location correlated, but um, you know these are all things. If you guys have the subcommittee has any thoughts on on how you want, we'll we'll, we'll be talking about all of this over the next couple of weeks. I guess one thing uh, it, that's I guess related is we have thought a lot about outdoor cultivation and, and like what percentage of the uh, total canopy should be outdoors because there's some kind of Vermont specific issues that we've we've talked about about a couple of them on this, um, but first one being obviously it's a uh, the cold weather leads to a, a short growing season. Um, uh, it also means that your harvest is going to come, and your so your biggest supply is going to come right at the time when, according to Andrew's model, uh, demand is at its lowest because uh, it looks like seasonal demand will kind of hit um, uh, hit its lowest point in, in that like late October, uh, early December stretch, um, just due to less tourism at that time of year. Um, so th there's some issues there. And I guess one of the more important things to note, um, and Andrew, uh, Andrew has a, a good uh, metaphor for it, but um, one of the issues with the potency limits and concentrates and how that will kind of keep the concentrate market uh, limited in Vermont is that it makes it hard to, to kind of like preserve uh, the, the harvest after it's done um, if you can't convert it, if you can't uh, extract it and uh, turn it into concentrate. So I think Andrew, if you're there, you can, you can uh, pop in with yours. But he, he kind of, his analogy was about uh, how apple orchards would look different if they weren't able to kind of convert it into cider or other or preserve the products in other ways yeah. to make sales continue throughout the year so all right Andrew, if you want to talk a little bit about the outdoor model and then uh, unfortunately we're kind of running out of time because i know we have to reserve a few minutes at the end here for public comment but uh, right. andrew why don't you talk about outdoor for a second and then we'll try to grab some public comment time yeah, you know, so I would say that the 20% is not a hard and fast rule. You know, I did some adjustments and things like that, and particularly if we're looking at like the shelf life, and if the shelf life of cannabis flower is more to three to four months versus two to three months, we might be able to have more like 30% without it really distorting things. But what this would essentially result in, and, and I think for, for people who are looking at this, it's, it's really a good example to look at what happened in Oregon which it is, um, you know, Oregon is a great market in a lot of ways, and I absolutely love how they, you know, opened their arms and uh, really encouraged individuals to come in who are from the existing legacy market. Um, you know, these small family farmers in Oregon that had, had uh, survived in certain places of the rural state by, by cultivating cannabis for generations, they welcomed them into the market, but because you know, Oregon only has a population of like three to four million people, and they have a lot of really good cannabis cultivators. They essentially ended on certain years, I think it was like the, uh, after, in the fall of 2017, with like three to four years worth of canopy cultivated of, of their demand. And it just, it just drove so many farmers out of business. It caused a spiraling and things like that. And I worry given the population size of Vermont, something, you know, and the, the, the high quality of existing uh, legacy market growers that, that something similar could happen. Um, now, Oregon could have done a lot more, you know, ensuring that those small farms were, those outdoor farms were small, and I think there were some issues they, they didn't realize early on that, that we can learn from. Um, but when we're evaluating this, right, the question is, is that, okay, let's say you, har you know, we, we harvest a lot of cannabis flower in uh, the end of September, early October. Now, it's perfect. You know, some of that will immediately go to you know tourists or people that are taking advantage of the beautiful fall foliage. But the ski season doesn't start until December, and with the way global warming is happening, and I'm not sure if this is the same case as ski season in Vermont as, as it is what I'm very used to in Colorado. The typical ski season in Colorado was like January through March, but because of global warming, it's actually shifted, and it's now like February to April. 
So we could end up with a situation in, in, of this happening. You know, I know there's been some years of uh, sad dry spells uh, in Vermont as far as the ski season. But the ski season doesn't start until January, February. And in that sort of case, you have all this, cat, all this good outdoor flour that's produced that there just isn't enough demand to eat up. Um, and if a lot of that is being produced and some of it ends up going bad or, you know, can't be turned into concentrates to be essentially preserved because the concentration process does enable those cannabinoids to, to stick around for longer, um, you know, by your, your summertime, uh, when things are coming back up again and, and cannabis cultivation, cannabis consumption tends to be higher in, in June, July, people are outside hiking, um, you end up with shortages. Um, and so that's where it's, you know, we want to ensure that we are welcoming with open arms, um, small farmers, you know, farmers that, you know, the best way to start a, a cannabis grow that doesn't require millions of dollars is to have a small farm and a hoop house outdoors. And if we want to accept those people, then um, we're going to want to welcome them in. But we also don't want to drive them out of business because of, uh, they can't handle the seasonal fluctuations. And so that's why, you know, striking that balance will allow them to exist in a market where, you know, hopefully they'll be able to store and, and figure out some good storage techniques so they can sell the flower, the outdoor harvest that they, they cropped out in October in, you know, March or April. Um, but if not, we want to ensure that there's not so much on the market all at once that their expected price that they get just isn't the price that they're able, that they're able to get in the market. Yeah, and we do have uh, one person with public comment. Uh, I know that we're okay. running, running short on yeah, time. Yeah, sorry. Here. Sorry about that. Yeah, Stephanie has one question. Is it a quick one, question, Stephanie, or did, um, and then we'll jump to the public comment. I just, uh, we can talk about it later, um, but just to state it, um, the concentrate question, I mean, isn't it possible to preserve uh, via concentrating, but then diluting when you make a, pro a product later on? So I don't know. Um, I, I just was thinking that 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 issue isn't present so long as the product that meets the market is compliant with the concentration standards, but or maybe it's being interpreted a little different. That's all. But we can talk about it later. Yes, I mean I'm happy to chat about that later. All right. I'm sorry for running so late, um, but I guess let's open it up for uh, for public comment. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Dave Silberman from Middlebury. I'll, I'll keep it brief. Thank you all. Um, look, I'm, I'm very concerned uh, about the risk that you are underestimating the, uh, the demand. Uh, the 55,000 uh, pounds output here is roughly what RAND uh, estimated was our demand in 2015. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a flower market back then. Uh, there was not a lot of demand uh, for uh, value-added products uh, in that model. Um, and, um, you know, my worry is that if you cap production too low um, and prices then become artificially high, um, we're going to lose one of the key benefits of Act 164, which was to bring the, the parallel illicit market into the regulated market. Um, if we keep prices high in the regulated market, that creates room for that parallel market to continue. Um, it, it, we only get them into the regulated market by undercutting the, uh, the parallel market and, 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 and making it so that the risk premium is no longer there for them. Um, <coughs> So, so I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned that if you put uh, production caps on the rec market, uh, we'll end up with a situation where three or five medical dispensaries uh, aren't subject to caps in their production under our statute. Um, and even if you try to change that statute, you won't do it in time uh, because of the way our legislative cycle works. And what we end up with is a very disequitable market where you have maybe out of your desired 400,000 square feet, uh, where you could have a third or half of it being produced by the medical incumbents. Uh, I think that would be a um, very bad result uh, that would um, suffer from a, a, a huge lack of political support in Vermont. Um, finally, I, you know, when, when I hear folks talking, worried about um, how to 
uh, you know, visit all these farms and, and how, to, how to heavily regulate. I, I, I just, I want to remind you, this is Vermont. We already have lots and lots of growers who already have seeds in the ground. We're not visiting their farms now at all. Whatever we do in this regulated market is more than we've been doing and is a net positive. We're not going to be able to get to all of these farms. There's going to be many, many of them. Um, you know, I, 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 I represent several uh, would-be growers in Addison County. We're pretty small. Um, you know, the thought that there will only be a hundred or a couple of hundred small growers in Vermont doesn't jive with what I'm seeing out there. Um, so again, um, just let's, let's make sure that we're giving all of the existing growers the opportunity to be in this market, uh, recognizing there, there's that risk on the other side, like what Oregon had with their price crash. Let's figure out how to manage that without driving people away from the regulated market. Thank you. Anyone else? That's, uh, that's it for the public comment uh, here in the room. Great, and I know, um, I just wanna say that we have um, received public comment through the, the, the web portal uh, that the board set up, and we've certainly taken into account if we had more time, I'd uh, start addressing some of those, but maybe we'll do that at a, a future meeting, but just anyone who has submitted comments there, I uh, just want everyone to know that they're they're being read and considered and uh, incorporated into these uh, into these discussions. Um, so I don't think I have anything else. Our next uh, our next uh, meeting uh, of this subcommittee is on Thursday afternoon at uh, one p.m. Eastern, I believe. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern. We're gonna, I think our agenda uh, will be to talk about the other license types other than cultivation, um, but obviously we ran out of time here today. Um, so feel free to bring up other cultivation related questions. All of these uh, topics are intertwined. Um, so, um, you know, we'll be a little frantic between now and October 1, make sure we get everything covered, but um, but that's that's our goal. So um, thanks everyone for your time. I don't know if I do I need to have a motion to adjourn for the day. Um, I guess, is there anyone who will uh, second that motion? Stephanie. Oh, yeah, thank I'll you, second. Stephanie. Or thank you for, yeah, thank you for seconding. Um, so I think we're, we're all done here. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning, and I'll uh, talk to everyone soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.